recording. So uh, today we're going to discuss how to make thermodynamic enolates. We discussed uh, kinetic enolates on Monday. Uh, and then we're going to get into reactions of enolates, focusing on the halogenation and the alkylation reactions. And um, we won't quite finish 23. There's more on alkylations. We'll, we'll probably spend about half the time on 23 on Friday and then half the time starting chapter 24. So on Monday, we introduced the concept of kinetic enolates versus thermodynamic enolates, less substituted versus more substituted. And we told you that to make a kinetic enolate, we need a very strong base that's going to irreversibly deprotonate our ketone. LDA is the base of choice. We need a polar aprotic solvent. Uh, THF is the most common one that is used. And then we need low temperature. That low temperature is going to suppress uh, the ability of uh, enolates to equilibrate. So minus 78, even though it's an unusual number, is a very convenient temperature to use uh, in a lab. So uh, in contrast, to make a thermodynamic enolate, we want to promote equilibration. We, we know that regardless of the conditions we use, that it, the kinetic enolate will always be formed the fastest. And so what we need to do is to uh, do everything we can to uh, accelerate or promote the e equilibrium so that that uh, less stable kinetic enolate can equilibrate and give us the more stable thermodynamic enolate. And so the first thing we want to do is use a strong base that's weaker than LDA. We want a strong base that's going to deprotonate our ketone, but not completely deprotonate our ketone. We want to have a little bit of enolate and a lot of ketone present. And I'll show you why in a moment. So the bases that are most commonly used for this are our alkoxide bases, our conjugate bases of uh, alcohols. So sodium ethoxide, and ET is an abbreviation we use just for ethyl. Okay, that's a common one. Uh, and then potassium tert-butoxide, possibly the most common uh, alkoxide base that we saw uh, in 351. Uh, also can be used for this purpose. So if we use either of those bases, we're going to have about 1% of our enolate and about 99% of our ketone. But that's advantageous, as I will show you. So we'll use our exam same example we have over here, 2-methylcyclohexanone. Uh, and we're going to have, we're going to make the kinetic enolate fastest regardless of the, uh, the, the reaction conditions, the nature of the base. But we're going to have about 1% of our enolate and about 99% of our ketone. And so these two species will collide in solution. How will the enolate react with the ketone? Yeah, it can deprotonate the ketone. Okay, so if the enolate collides with the ketone and it deprotonates from the less substituted side, it's just going to make another equivalent of itself. That would be what we would call a degenerate reaction. Uh, the products are going to be the same as the reactants. But if it happens to deprotonate on the more substituted side, it provides a way of equilibrating our kinetic enolate into the thermodynamic enolate. Okay. So having a small amount of enolate and a large amount of ketone present is uh, desirable, preferential for generating the thermodynamic enolate because it allows this equilibrium. Okay. Now, please note that the equilibrium between enolate and ketone is not going to change. We're still going to have just 1% of our enolate and about 99% of our ketone. But in regards to this equilibrium, it is going to be towards the right uh, because we're going to have more of the thermodynamic enolate than we will of the kinetic enolate. So of that 1% that forms the enolate, a majority of it will be the thermodynamic enolate 
and the, and the minor product would be the kinetic enolate. Okay. Questions about this equilibrium here? Okay. So second point is we want to use a polar protic solvent because a polar protic solvent can also promote equilibrium. Okay. How would a polar protic solvent react with an enolate? It would protonate the enolate, another acid-base reaction. Okay. So what it does is it accelerates the equilibrium between enolate and ketone. That equilibrium, of course, favors the ketone. But if you, the faster you reach equilibrium, the more of the thermodynamic enolate you will have of that small percentage of species that is enolate. Okay, so it promotes equilibrium by converting the enolate back into the ketone. Um, and then, of course, once you get the ketone, the base can deprotonate it again and give us the enolate back. Uh, and before too long, the thermodynamic enolate is the major enolate in solution. So the most common polar protic solvents that are used are the conjugate acids of our alkoxide bases. If we're using ethoxide, we would want to use ethanol. Because when we protonate our enolate with ethanol, we generate ethoxide. And so we would just be generating the same base that is already present. If we used a different alcohol, we'd end up with a different base. And we'd have a jumble of bases, which could be problematic. So usually, we're going to use the conjugate acid of our alkoxide base as the solvent. So that's going to be either ethanol or tert butyl alcohol. Okay. And then the third thing we're going to do to promote equilibration is we're going to run the reaction at a higher temperature than the kinetic enolate formation. Kinetic enolate formation at a very, very low temperature. Uh, here, we don't really need to heat it up. Uh, we simply run the reaction at room temperature. Uh, and of course, the higher the temperature, the faster we reach equilibrium. Uh, room temperature is usually fast enough to help or, a, a, a high enough temperature uh, to help us reach equilibrium. So we put all of this together. And if we take our 2-methylcyclohexanone and we react it with sodium ethoxide, and we use ethanol as our solvent, 25 degrees is, is pretty close to room temperature in, in most labs. We're going to end up with our more substituted kinetic, or sorry, I forgot to draw my methyl group there. More substituted thermodynamic enolate. Okay. And the way I've drawn these equilibrium arrows reminds us that we're only going to have about 1% of this enolate in solution and about 99% of the ketone. In some cases, that creates a problem, but in other cases, that's fine. Uh, for example, if we can consume this enolate in an irreversible reaction, then by Le Chatelier's principle, more of the ketone will be converted into the enolate. Okay, so if we can react that thermodynamic enolate irreversibly, uh, then uh, the fact that we only have about 1% of it at equilibrium is not going to be a problem. Any questions? Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about stereochemistry and how it applies to enolates. Okay, and let's go over and look at a figure from the book showing the three-dimensional structure of an enolate. Okay, let's switch over here. Okay, so this is the enolate of acetone. Uh, we've drawn the minor contributor here. It doesn't really matter which one you draw. 
Uh, but all three of the atoms, the two carbons and the oxygen in our enolate system are going to be sp2 hybridized because that's what enables the conjugation uh, that provides stability to enolates. Here in the minor contributor, we would say the lone pair is on this carbon. It's going to be in a p orbital so that it's conjugated with the carbon-oxygen double bond. If we drew the major contributor, uh, we would have the lone pair in a p orbital on the oxygen. We would have a carbon-carbon double bond. Um, uh, but either way you slice it, it's going to be a planar species. Is it chiral? Is this acetone enolate chiral? It is not chiral. Okay, no stereocenters. Sometimes when we uh, react enolates uh, at the alpha carbon, we can turn the alpha carbon into a stereocenter. So we can make chiral products from an achiral enolate. When we do so, how will they be formed? As a single enantiomer or as a racemic mixture? It'd be a racemic mixture. If we have an achiral, uh, uh, achiral enolate uh, reacting that with some kind of electrophile, uh, we would get a racemic mixture. So this has some consequences. Let's say that we have a ketone such as this one. This ketone is chiral. The alpha carbon is a stereocenter. And let's say we expose that ketone to base. Okay, we've exposed it to hydroxide. Okay. We already know the equilibrium is not going to be favorable, uh, but we are going to be able to make a percentage or so of our enolate. Okay. Our ketone was chiral. Is our enolate chiral? No, our enolate's not chiral. So we have taken uh, a chiral molecule and we've destroyed our stereocenter, turned it into an achiral uh, intermediate. Of course, we produce water in the process. Uh, that water uh, can protonate the enolate. The enolate is planar. So the water is going to approach the enolate either from the top face or the bottom face. Is there going to be any difference in the rate by which that enolate approaches the top versus the bottom? There is not. I see head shaking. That's correct. There's no difference. So you're going to get, and in that enolate, that, that equilibrium is going to favor the ketone. You're going to get a racemic mixture. And I've run out of room here to draw both enantiomers, so I'm going to show them kind of in a shorthand way that we use sometimes. If we draw a squiggly line, that indicates that we have both enantiomers present. So that's what this squiggly line here, uh, this carbon-hydrogen bond means. It means that we have a racemic mixture. Okay. So this process I've shown you here on the board is called racemization. Um, the process of converting uh, an, a single enantiomer into a racemic mixture. In most cases, racemization is bad. Usually we don't want racemization to occur. Usually if we have a single enantiomer, we want to retain that single enantiomer. So what this means is that we want to keep our aldehydes and ketones, if they're chiral, especially at the alpha carbon, we want to keep them away from strong bases, because otherwise they will undergo racemization. Any questions? Okay, so now let's discuss reactions of enolates, okay? So enolates are nucleophilic, and they're going to react with electrophiles. We've seen halogens as electrophiles before, reacting with nucleophilic alkenes. Uh, so halogens are able to react with uh, enolates. Uh, and this reaction is called the halogenation. Okay. We're going to form a carbon-halogen bond to the alpha carbon. We'll get a ketone back uh, from this reaction. 
Our enolates can also react with alkyl halides. Okay. That allows us to form a carbon carbon bond to the alpha uh, carbon here. Okay. And we have halide as a leaving group. Uh, we had halide as a leaving group up here as well. Uh, this reaction is known as the alkylation because we are attaching an alkyl group to the alpha carbon. Okay. Uh, and then there's a third reaction that enolates can undergo. In our last section of the class, we learned that carbonyl compounds are electrophilic. They're electrophilic on the carbonyl carbon. Right? That carbonyl carbon has a partial positive charge. And so enolates are able to attack carbonyl carbons. That reaction is known as the aldol reaction. Okay, this is just an intermediate that is formed uh, in an aldol reaction. Uh, and then various things can happen to the aldol product. We'll cover that in chapter 24, so we won't say much about it now, except that you'll notice this reaction forms a carbon-carbon bond this reaction down here, the alkylation reaction, forms a carbon-carbon bond. So these are very, very useful reactions. Alkylations and aldol reactions uh, are widely used in organic chemistry. Okay. So uh, let's talk in more detail about the halogenation reaction. And the halogenation reaction uh, is able to proceed either in acid or in base, okay? And we're going to show you the mechanism in acid initially. Uh, it is catalytic in the acid, as I'll show you. First, first, I'll just draw the generic reaction on the board here. where we're substituting a halogen for a hydrogen in the presence of either acid or base. Previously in the class, uh, when we've done halogenation reactions, halogenation of alkenes, for example, uh, we've only used chlorine or bromine. When we did radical halogenation reactions, it was only chlorine or bromine. Uh, in this case, it's a little bit uh, broader scope. We can use chlorine, bromine, or iodine. So iodine is reactive enough to react with enolates. Uh, fluorine is still much too reactive. Uh, we're not going to be doing any uh, fluorinations uh, with F2. Okay. So uh, when we perform the reaction in acid, it is catalytic in acid. Are we going to be able to generate an enolate in the presence of acid? Think back to something I told you about mechanisms in chapter 22. Can we form a negatively charged intermediate under acidic conditions? No. All right, that was another question on the multiple choice that uh, caught some people. He tried to invoke a negatively charged intermediate uh, under acidic conditions. So uh, when we use acid, we're not going to have an enolate as our nucleophile. What do you think is going to be the nucleophile instead? What relative of an enolate can we form under acidic conditions that we learned about on Monday? The enol. Okay, so we're going to form an enol when we perform a halogenation under acidic conditions. So we're going to use acetone as our example. I'm just going to draw one of the alpha hydrogens in because uh, it's going to be the one that's replaced. And we're typically going to use acetic acid uh, in these reactions because acetic acid can function both as the acid and as the solvent. Okay. So acetic acid is a weak acid, 
So protonation of the carbonyl oxygen is not going to be favorable. But that doesn't matter too much, as I'll show you in a moment. Uh, you'll get a small fraction of the conjugate acid of the uh, ketone. Okay, And then we're going to generate acetate ion. Okay. Now, this isn't a very favorable equilibrium, so our acetate ion can simply deprotonate the oxygen that it just protonated and go back to our uh, reactants. But it could also deprotonate the alpha hydrogen. And when it does so, that's going to form the enol. Okay, so that equilibrium is not going to be favorable. But we will get a small amount of the enol present. Okay. When we generate the enol, uh, that enol is going to be, oh, and you'll notice that we just formed our acetic acid back. Remember, I told you the reaction was catalytic uh, in the acid. So we get less than 1% of our enol, but whenever we get the enol, that enol can react with our halogen. We'll use bromine in this case as the example. Okay, so we're going to brominate. That's going to be an irreversible process. The, the carbon-bromine bond we form is going to be stronger than the bromine-bromine bond that is broken. That's going to give us bromide ion and this protonated carbonyl. Now, when we reacted a normal alkene back in 351 with a halogen, what kind of intermediate did we form? Okay, remember we have a comprehensive final coming up, so it's important to make these connections between topics this semester and topics last semester. We formed a bridged halonium ion intermediate, a three-membered ring intermediate, that was more stable than the carbocation. So if we if we just used a regular alkene to attack a halogen and broke that bromine-bromine bond, we would get a carbocation. And now it's higher in energy than the bridge telonium ion. Here, when an enol acts as our nucleophile, we don't get the bridge telonium ion because we don't form a carbocation. We form this resonance stabilized oxonium ion species. Okay? We have a minor contributor with a positive charge on carbon, but most of the charge here is on oxygen. So because an enol has the ability to form this cationic intermediate, we don't need to make that bridge telonium ion that we made when we reacted a normal alkene with a halogen. Any questions? OK, uh, so once we get to here, now our bromide can deprotonate our carbonyl. Uh, and that gives us our alpha bromoketone. And then you'll see that we generate HBr uh, as a byproduct in this reaction. Okay. Any questions about uh, halogenation under acidic conditions? So just remember that we're going to have less than 1% of our enol present. This equilibrium strongly favors the ketone. But that 1% of the enol will react irreversibly with our halogen. And so we can use Le Chatelier's principle to drive this reaction to completion. All right, when we perform halogenations in base, uh, we have a different situation. We start out, let's use this ketone. We have two alpha hydrogens. We're going to use hydroxide. We typically use hydroxide or an alkoxide base uh, in these reactions. And that's going to generate just about 1% or so of our enolate, but that's, that's not a problem. We form water in the process. Here's our enolate. Uh, and once we generate our enolate, our enolate can react with our halogen. We'll use bromine again in this case. 
uh, in a comparable fashion to how our enol reacted with bromine. Okay. That'll be irreversible, generating our alpha bromoketone. Uh, and then we've generated bromide as a byproduct. Okay. All right. There, yes, question, Ben. Okay. Yeah, so with uh, hydroxide and water, we can make the hydrate from the ketone. The hydrate is not a nucleophile, so the hydrate's not going to react with the halogen. So you have two equilibriums going on, an equilibrium between the ketone and the hydrate. That's a dead end, right? So you'll have less than 1% of the hydrate, and it's not going to do anything except go back to the ketone. We have a second unfavorable equilibrium between ketone and enolate, but that's not a dead end. That allows us to perform this halogenation. Uh, and so that's how we can funnel all of our ketone into this product. Okay, so we will have less than 1% of hydrate. That equilibrium does exist. We learned about it in chapter 21, but it's a dead end. That hydrate is not going to react with anything. So there's, we can't use Le Chatelier's principle to force the reaction to go towards the hydrate. But we do have a problem. And that problem is that this ketone product also has an alpha hydrogen uh, and that can be deprotonated by our base okay so our hydroxide can deprotonate the product of the reaction generating an enolate and as i draw this enolate you should be asking yourselves is that enolate from the product going to be more stable or less stable than the original enolate. Okay, let's look at these two enolates. More st is this more stable or less stable than that? All right, with the silence, I'll give you a hint. It is not less stable. So tell me why it is more stable. Yes, Sydney. Okay, the alkene is more substituted, yes. Uh, is the bromine, or the bromide, is it an electron withdrawing group or an electron donating group? It's a withdrawing group. That's another one of those things we learned in electrophilic aromatic substitution. It's a withdrawing group. And so if you attach an electron withdrawing group to a molecule that's negatively charged, you're going to stabilize it. Okay, so this enolate is more stable than that one. Meaning that instead of just having 1% of it at equilibrium, we're probably going to have somewhere around 5 to 10%. Okay? So as we start to generate the monohalogenated product, it is going to enolize preferentially relative to the starting material. Okay? So we're not going to be able to hold on to this. Uh, it's going to turn into the enolate. And then that enolate will react with bromine. And we're going to get a dibrominated product. Okay. So the base promoted halogenation differs from the acid catalyzed halogenation for a couple of reasons. One is we're consuming our base. We start with hydroxide, we end with bromide. We've converted a strong base into a weak base, so we're not regenerating our base. And two, our product ketone is more reactive than our starting ketone. So as we start to produce this, it's going to react. If we limited ourselves to one equivalent of our base, we would have mixtures of monohalogenated product, dihalogenated product, and unreacted ketone. We'd have a mess. Usually we don't want that. So most of the time when we perform these reactions, we are going to use excess of the base to be able to obtain an excess of our halogen as well uh, to make sure that we replace all of the alpha hydrogens uh, and generate the polyhalogenated product. So in base, halogenation is only useful to generate 
the polyhalogenated product. Now, an interesting thing happens when we have a methyl ketone in this reaction. If our ketone has a methyl group attached, So I'll draw acetophenone. This is a, a simple methyl ketone. We're going to react that with excess halogen. We're also going to use excess base. And interestingly, what we're going to end up with is a carboxylate. So this, is, this, this looks like an oxidation. We've oxidized our ketone. We, now we have a carboxylate, the conjugate base of a carboxylic acid. And then we're going to get this species, HCX3. That is known in generic terms as halo form. The halo form that you're most familiar with is chloroform. If X is chlorine, that's going to be chloroform. Bromoform and iodoform also exist. Uh, iodoform is interesting because iodoform is a yellow solid. Uh, and so if you perform this reaction with iodide, what happens is you get this yellow precipitate that forms. And that was actually used in the olden days before spectroscopy as a way of determining that you had a methyl ketone. So if you knew you had an organic, if you had an organic compound and you didn't know its structure, but you knew it had a ketone, you might wonder whether one of the groups attached to it is a methyl group. Nowadays, you can just uh, dissolve your molecule in deuterated chloroform and take an NMR. And if you see a singlet at about 2.3 or so, you know that you have a methyl group attached to your ketone. But before NMR spectroscopy, chemists had to use reactions uh, to determine the structures of their molecules. And if they reacted their ketone with excess iodine and base, and they got a yellow precipitate, then they knew they had a methyl group attached. And so that's how this haloform reaction was used typically. But what's going on here? Uh, let's take a look at the mechanism on the screen. The first two steps are just the same as what I've drawn on the board. Uh, we make the enolate with hydroxide. We get a small amount of that enolate, but it irreversibly reacts with iodine and gives us the alpha iodo ketone. Of course, this ketone is more acidic than that one, uh, so we're not going to be able to stop here. We don't try to stop. Uh, we use excess iodine and hydroxide uh, to repeat the alpha iodination two times, uh, and we generate this triiodo methyl ketone. Now, we have excess base present, so the base can attack our ketone, and then something unusual happens. The tetrahedral intermediate we get collapses and eliminates out the Ci3 minus group. That's a carbanion. That has a negative charge on the carbon. Why are we using that as a leaving group? How does this work? I'll draw it on the board for you, and while I do, think about how this works. It does work. Any ideas? How can we use this as a leaving group? Shouldn't it be really basic? Yes, Ben? Exactly. We have three electronegative atoms. We have three bonds between carbon and more electronegative atoms polarized towards those iodines. Okay. So that negative charge is delocalized by induction on the iodine. So it's not really a carbon ion. So it is still relatively basic, but its basicity is low enough that it can function as a leaving group. Uh, but it is basic enough to deprotonate the carboxylic acid that results. Okay, so we get a carboxylic acid here. Uh, this is kind of like what happens in saponification. In saponification, you eliminate out hydroxide, and then that deprotonates the carboxylic acid. Okay. Um, or you, you eliminate out an alkoxide, sorry, not hydroxide. You eliminate an alkoxide, and that deprotonates the carboxylic acid. Here, in the haloform reaction, you eliminate out the triiodo uh, 
uh, ion here, uh, and then that deprotonates your uh, carboxylic acid, giving us the carboxylate product and the iota form. Okay, so irreversible acid-base reaction here at the end. Any questions about the halo form reaction? Okay, so we have a summary here of the halogenation reactions that we have learned. We can perform halogenation in acid, and that's what allows us to perform a monohalogenation. If we want monohalogenation, we need to use acid, usually acetic acid, as the solvent in the acid. If we want to perform polyhalogenation, then we use base. Uh, and we would want to use excess of both components to, to be able to replace all of our alpha hydrogens. And when it is a methyl ketone, we can't stop at the trihalogenated species because it will undergo the haloform reaction, generating our carboxylate uh, and our haloform byproduct. Okay? So why do we want to make alpha halo carbonyl compounds? What can we do with them? Well, we learned last semester that alkyl halides undergo substitutions and eliminations. Uh, and so that's usually what we see with uh, alpha halo carbonyl compounds. If we perform an elimination, a dehydrohalogenation, we're going to generate an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl compound. And we know those are useful uh, because those undergo 1,4 additions with cuprates. Right, so they're, they're, they're useful intermediates. So we can do eliminations. Uh, we can also perform substitutions. And the book shows us an example of that. Uh, this particular one is an intramolecular SN2 reaction using this amine as a nucleophile. Uh, they should have shown the stereochemistry here because that's obviously going to proceed with inversion of configuration. Uh, they have shown stereochemistry here, uh, giving us a single isomer uh, of this product that was converted into quinine, which is an anti-malarial compound. The hydroxide here was just to uh, deprotonate the positively charged nitrogen after it functioned as a nucleophile. So the message is uh, that we can perform uh, SN2 reactions with these alpha halo ketones, uh, and we can also perform eliminations uh, to generate alpha beta unsaturated ketones uh, that could then react with organocuprates, okay? All right, let's talk about the alkylation reaction uh, where we are attaching an alkyl group forming a carbon-carbon bond by reacting our enolate with an alkyl halide. So here we're gonna use for this example, at least, are kinetic enolate conditions, although I've given a ketone that's uh, only going to form a single type of enolate because it only has one type of alpha hydrogen. And then we're going to react that enolate with our alkyl halide, forming a carbon-carbon bond. Okay. And then our halide ion, uh, that's going to be our leaving group. That's just going to make a salt with our lithium cation from our LDA. Uh, and then, of course, we're also going to generate our conjugate uh, base, or sorry, our conjugate acid of LDA, which is our diisopropylamine. So these are all the products we're going to get uh, from this particular reaction. So... The alkylation step, what kind of a mechanism is it? One that we saw last semester. One of our most common mechanisms with alkyl halides. What kind of mechanisms do alkyl halides undergo? There's four choices. Looking at this one, you should be able to see which of those four choices it is. Substitution, SN1 or SN2. Is this a strong nucleophile? It's a strong base. It's negatively charged, so it's a strong nucleophile. So this is going to be an SN2 mechanism. 
What kinds of alkyl halides can participate in SN2 mechanisms? There's two kinds. Well, three kinds, I guess, because you could say methyl halides. And then what other kinds of halides? Primary and secondary. But in this particular SN2 reaction, we can only use methyl halides and primary halides. Okay? We cannot use secondary alkyl halides. Secondary alkyl halides, if you remember from 351, typically undergo a mixture of SN2 and E2 reactions. Enolates are significantly stronger bases than the nucleophiles we used in 351. So because this is a stronger base, it is going to perform eliminations with secondary alkyl halides. Okay, so we would only see the substitution with the primary alkyl halides. Okay, so we'll draw our enolate here to show you what we mean. If this enolate encountered a secondary alkyl halide, such as isopropyl iodide, instead of performing a substitution, it's just going to perform an E2 reaction, functioning as a really expensive and elaborate base to uh, remove that uh, hydrogen and generate propene and just give you back the ketone that you had started with. Okay? Usually we don't want that. So these will only work with primary alkyl halides. Any questions? All right, so we can uh, form enolates from esters, uh, and we can also perform alkylations with ester enolates. Okay, so we treat this ester with LDA, THF minus 78. Our ester enolate is going to look like this. Esters only have one set of alpha hydrogens, so we don't have to worry about kinetic versus thermodynamic. If we react that with a primary alkyl halide, we will perform an alkylation, generating a product looking like this. We know we can make enolates from nitriles or enolate-like species. You don't actually call them enolates, but uh, let's go ahead and draw this out. Our LDA will deprotonate, and we get this cumulated anion species. Uh, which behaves like an enolate, and that's going to react with our alkyl halide in this fashion. Our primary alkyl halide, I should say, giving us this nitrile product. So we can perform alkylations of esters, we can perform alkylations of nitriles, we can perform alkylations of ketones, uh, we can also perform alkylations of aldehydes. Now, um, the ketones we showed you here just had one set of alpha hydrogens. Uh, if we have two sets of alpha hydrogens, uh, then we would have uh, the question of whether we were forming the kinetic enolate or the thermodynamic enolate, right? And we could make either one, and we could alkylate either one uh, to get uh, two different constitutional isomers of our products. So we'll, we'll start with that on Friday. Uh, and we'll finish our discussion of alkylation uh, on Friday uh, before jumping into uh, aldol reactions in chapter 24.